All right, welcome everybody. Welcome everybody. So if you do not have one of the two handouts I've given you, please, please raise your hand. Nikita is going to come and give that to you. And Nikita is the greatest person. You know, sliced bread is important. And Nikita is that good at sliced bread. The best. Yeah, they'll get, she'll get to you guys. All right, she's that good. All right, welcome everybody. Let's go ahead. Let's go ahead and pray as we start. Father, we just commit this time to you and thank you so much that you're giving us the opportunity to learn about the wonderful things that you've given us in the past two thousand years. Father, it couldn't. We could have never done it without the work of your Holy Spirit and without the work of your Son, because you made it possible for us to know you, to know you. There is nothing better for a man that they could but to know you. Father, we just commit this to you and thank you so much in Jesus' name. All right, one of the things we're doing today is, first of all, I handed everybody, I, everybody's going to get a, there's going to be a survey because we have wonderful elders and, and I was telling them as a teacher, I'm a full-time teacher, and as a full-time teacher, what I, I do is I always have to be critiqued by my class. Well, that's good because I, it helps me to get better and better and better. So every time I teach a class again, it gets better and better because I get critiqued and I ask questions. So if you wonder why I, go to eat, I, I walk up to you guys and ask you, do you like the class? What do you think? All I'm trying to do is really get you guys to try to give me a little information on, no, it really sucks. No, I really like it. No, it's the best thing in the world. No, it's the worst thing I've ever heard. You know, and the reason is, is because it helps me to shape this because I've never taught a history class before. I've only taught medical history as part of a medical science course. Never a history. So I'm. So please, uh, if you guys want to fill this out, let me. You know, even if you take it home, take a picture and send it back to me. You don't have to put your name on it. You don't have to do that. And I do that because as a teacher, I'm not allowed to have students put their names on it. But you can if you want. But in regular school, because they want to make sure that I don't have any problems. So please check this out. Now, this uh, one of the reasons why I give you guys these packets, and it's a ton of history. And the reason why is because we just don't have enough time during the day to really get into it. And the other reason is, when I first started this class, what I wanted to do was every single time give you, get, give you a little nugget from the Bible. So if you notice from my Old Testament class, the slides have been cut down almost in half. I cut those down because I don't want to give you too much. But I also want to make sure everybody leaves with a little nugget from the Bible. So I always incorporate that, which means it makes us lose the ability to see the rest of history. So what I do is I write it in here. To understand history is to understand the church, because history, church was made because of history. The problems in the Roman Empire, the problems, in, the problems with the Middle Ages, the rise of the Catholic Church, the rise of the Eastern Orthodox Church, what happened in Russia, what happened in England, what happened, all these places are starting to come together. And I put it all in here. I even went, did a little bit on skin color. I, I teach a class. I teach the integumentary system, and I talk about where skin So people from this region is usually this. And I did that because to help everybody understand that we're all part of God's kingdom, of who we are. No matter what we look like, we are part of God's kingdom, but we look like what we look like because of where our ancestors came from. And there's a reason. I kind of put that in there also. This is kind of a fun thing for everybody to see. So kind of an excerpt from my integumentary system class. So anyway, but this is going to be, this is very important. So I, and I know I ask you guys to do a lot of stuff, but I feel like the best way to learn history is to immerse yourself in it. And one other thing I'm going to give, show you guys is this. This is the latest Christian history magazine. Let me tell you, this bad boy right here, if you can see, there's the Cairo on it. Remember the Cairo from Constantine? He had that, put that on his flag, everything will be good, change everything. So this whole, this particular magazine it, right here is actually almost every single thing that we are going over right now, they're talking about because they're talking about the early church. Where were the early churches found? Where were, who were the, who were the early fa church fathers? Who were, you know, different things. So I highly, highly recommend this magazine. It's all you have to do is go on ChristianHistory.com. Or they've been actually, I think they've been doing this for almost 40 years. Seriously, they've been out for a long time. 
but, and you can just give them a donation and they give you the magazine. So really good because it literally goes over everything we're talking about. Because I've been reading, it's like, wow, we just talked about that. All right. Now, one of the things I also realized in this that I never really wanted to do was I, I have been somewhat critical of the Catholic Church in some of my things. Now, what you may not realize is that I also created another video for us, another class video, last week on the rise of Islam. So I did that, and that's also part. So please, it's on YouTube. I really recommend you doing this because I also gave you guys that handout, Muhammad, the Good, the Bad, and the Ugly. I, thought, I hope you got a lot out of it. I thought that was an excellent article. So I did a video on it. Please go back and watch that because we not, didn't have time to get that information in. But I feel like I've been a little critical because in history, we don't like to be critical of people because we just want to tell you what happened. I'm not here to, to judge if they're good, bad, or indifferent, but we're here to do that. Now, Granted, I think we can make some good choices with that, but one of the things I want to do today is I kind of want to go into, and I wish I wouldn't have wrote that. I didn't like that when I read that last night. What the Catholics do right. It's not that what they did right, is that I really think the really great things that the Catholic Church did should have been a better way to put it. So I apologize to those people, who, anybody who's watching, and to you guys, my goal is not to sit and rip on them. My goal is really more so to tell you um, what I felt like they really did a great job with this. But what did they do? Because we, we've talked about a lot of things that they kind of went a lot this way, or this direction. But the thing is, one of the things I realized is that, you know, they did do some really, really, really good things. One of the biggest thing I realized is that they, in, their, in the mass, if you ever, and I really, really recommend if you've never been to a Catholic mass, just go do it. It is a huge, you learn so much. You're like, wow, because you got to remember what they're doing the mass right now is the same thing they did 1,700 years ago. They literally run it the same way. So there's a lot of history there. But the thing is about the mass that I like is that the mass, everything they do from the beginning to the very end glorifies one person, Jesus. And it's amazing how they do it. They have little chants, they sing things, they, they, they give testimony, they do, they, you know, everything is about Jesus, and it's amazing. So I really recommend you ever doing that, to go there just to check it out. So everything, everything is about Jesus, and also the other thing the whole Mass is about is a communion. Remember the early church, 100 AD, we talked about the second one, that communion was the central role of everything in the early church. Communion was extremely important because it basically tells us, you know, helps us remember what Jesus did for us. So they did that. So, and Paul says kind of the same thing. For he says, I resolved to know nothing while I was with you except for Jesus Christ. If your church or anybody's not teaching about Jesus, if Jesus isn't the central theme of everything, now granted, that doesn't mean we don't read the Old Testament because how do we learn about who Jesus is? It's from the Old Testament. We learn about why we need Jesus, what brought us to this point. That's important. But the second thing, may I never boast except for the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ through which the world has been crucified to me and I to the world. We be, when we become Christians, we become part of the church. We become Christians because God comes and lives in us. It's an amazing thing what God does. Just to realize that God loves me. Remember about the Islam? Islam? They don't know God. God's like this distant thing for them. No, God doesn't talk to them. God doesn't care about them. God doesn't really do anything. You just do what I tell you to do and everything will be okay. That's really sad because our God, he wants to know us. That's amazing. Jesus said, now this is eternal life. What is the eternal life means? This is the greatest thing that it could be in all eternal life. That they may know you, the one true God, and Jesus Christ, his son. So the one thing they, the, the Catholics did really was phenomenal in the Mass is that's all they do is point to Jesus. They all, the other thing they do is state the creed. I love the creed, and we went through the creed in great detail because it's so important. It is basically what we understand. It is the basic tenet of our faith. You know, and I love that every time you go to a Catholic service, they, they say this. And the, the reason why they say it is just to remind them who they are. 
So, but the, question, the problem is that the Protestant Reformation, which did some good and bad things, is it changed all of that. And we're gonna, so we're going to be going to the Protestant Reformation in two weeks. Okay? We're going to go into what led up to it next week, and then we're going to start in it. The Protestant Reformation, there were some good and bad things. One of the bad things was is that they, they based everything on tradition rather than the actual Bible. That's never a good thing. But the good thing is their traditions are, there's always good things in traditions. Now, I know most Protestants, we don't like tradition because we think, well, it's like Catholic. But I think we've got to get out of that idea. Just, just because a church you know, kind of went the wrong direction and used everything in tradition doesn't mean traditions are bad. I love traditions. But one of the things we see in the Protestant Reformation, what they did en masse, is they used to go in and burn down Catholic churches. Seriously, in the 15th and 16th century. They looted and burned the artwork. They burned the statues. They burned everything. And it was, you know, even Luther was just like, mortified. He was like, my gosh, this is not good. Not a good thing, because you can't just go and destroy something because you don't like it. But we can learn from the Old Testament how to understand Christian history. The one thing about, I love about the Old Testament is that it, is, it tells you the whole story. It doesn't mess around. Everybody, David, Abraham, Moses, Solomon, they've all been shown to have big, big good traits and bad traits. And it really, the, if you want to see, understand sanctification, which just means how God creates us into his image, read those guys. Because he takes a whole, you, you learn this, watch their whole life as God creates them into his image. David was, like, like Jeff's teaching, David is a phenomenal thing about sanctification like we learn now. Because David is watched, you can watch from the very beginning and how he God grooms him and gets him ready to be king. Paul states that everything was written in the past was written to teach us that through, the, through endurance, through the scriptures, we might find encouragement. And the thing is the same with, with Christian history. We can learn from the good things and the bad things. We've got to know both. History should never be deleted. Don't get rid of history. Don't get rid of certain parts of history. You know, America is, is, has good, America has bad. We need to teach both. But if you just teach the bad and not the good, or just the good without the bad, you're not giving the full story. And we can't learn from it. So, next guys, now let's talk about the church fathers. Oh, I love these guys. Church fathers. So we're going to go through some church fathers today. We're going to kind of discuss what they did. Now, they li most of them lived in a an austere life. Well, I gave you the, I gave you the definition. Basically, they're like, they, they had a life with no comforts, luxuries, very aesthetic. You know, there's good and bad with that. The reality is, is that sometimes it's, it's good that they basically said, you know, the, they saw that the rich, was, the rich people were going after the poor, and there was, there was a huge class dynamic. So, but we've got to understand why they did it, because there was class systems back then. If you ever know anything about caste system, go study, go study India, the uh, Indian culture, the, um, you know, India, for India, the country, their culture. They have a caste system of four classes. And whatever you're born into, you're, that's what you are, and you're never going to get out of it. And they will go after you if you try to get out of it. That's what happened. These, and that's one of the things these guys did. They had a class structure, the Flebians, the, the Patricians, and the Flebians. If you were down here in this level, you'll never get up. The only way you can get up in Rome was through the military, and that's under what, the reason why they had a million people in their army. So they had a class structure. Christians, they said, no class structure. There is no better Christian than this Christian. There's no better. Now, granted, it kind of went that direction with the monasteries and stuff, but for the most part, the early church fathers, that was one of the things they preached against was class structure. For nearly 40 years, they created much of the theology that we learn today. They were persecuted. They were exiled. They were killed for their faith. These people endured a lot of bad stuff. Now, let's talk about Polycarp. Oh, wait a minute. Not that po that's not Polycarp. Wait a minute. Polycarp. Oh, yeah. That's Polycarp. <laughs> I figure I'd throw you for a loop there. Ha <laughs> ha. Polycarp, yeah. Carp. <laughs> anyway. Uh, so, sorry, when I thought about it, I thought about SpongeBob for some reason. I don't know why. 
But anyway, so Polycarp. Polycarp is a, is a really cool dude because this guy was the Bishop of Smyrna. Now, the interesting thing about Polycarp is what we know. Does anybody know who trained Polycarp? John, yes, John the Apostle trained Polycarp, which means, so this guy is what we call a second generation apostolic father. So this guy was the first guys after the apostles, but he's also one of the first people to be killed, martyred. And interesting thing, he was martyred in the arena. Now I love, now actually he said a bunch of, a bunch of interesting things. First he says, if you think I will swear by the genius of Caesar, then you don't know who I am. Hear me, hear me clearly. I'm a Christian. He proclaimed it. And, he, and they were calling him an atheist. And what he looked and he pointed to the crowd and said, no, you're the atheists. You don't believe in the one true God. This guy was pretty bold. Sadly, they burned him at the stake. But you know, I'm telling you, he is a good guy to look to. You know, what we should do is give kids these kind of cards. Forget the sports figures. Sports figures who beat their wives and, you know, drive drunk and all these other things or do bad things. No, we should, give sp we should give sport cards for the kids for our church fathers. Who do we look up to? Yes, we look up to these guys. Arrhenius. Arrhenius was another early Christian. Now, he was not trained by the, by the um, this guy could be considered a third generation church father. But the thing is, he was basic bishop of Lyon, or Lyon, basic, I think they say in France, which is in Gaul. If you ever heard the word Gaul, it's not like a stone in your system, not a stone in your, in your, you know, gall, in your gallbladder. It's actually a place in France. It actually is France. So his greatest work was against heresies. We actually looked into some of that in the very beginning of the class when we went through heresies on Gnostics. He was really outspoken against Gnostics. Remember, the Bible talks about Gnostics. In, okay, John mentions it, and also in Revelations it talks about it. So Gnostics was a very big problem, and he wrote the book on it. He was amazing. Cyprian. Now, we've been going through Cyprian. Everybody knows Cyprian by now. The guy wrote on, you know, on the church. He wrote a big thing on the church and everything, and he had some good ideas with the church. He was the bishop of Carthage. If you wonder where Carthage is, Carthage is basically North Africa. It's like right over here in North, like Western North Africa. So he's in Carthage. Basically, this guy really wanted to try to, you know, get people to focus on the church. Now, next week, what I'm going to do is I'm going to be writing a little bit on, instead of writing all the history, I'm going to be writing a little bit of how, what the Christian, early Christian fathers had to deal with, with creating a kingdom of God. It was very difficult creating something from scratch. Look, going from a pagan society, that the polytheistic pagan society, to a monotheistic society focused on God in his ways. Very difficult. But the thing is, one thing that I do say that, that Cyprian did, I think, was a little too much, is he started giving too much, too much power to the bishops, too much power to the people that were over people, so in the church. And they, that kind of went into a bad thing. I don't think he meant to do it, but it kind of happened. Jerome, oh, Jerome. This... Um, if I remember right... Was he... Yeah, let me tell you, when was he, um, I think he was martyred. Do you, do you remember, do you remember if he was martyred? I don't remember Cyprian, if he died. I knew it was, I know, I, well, no, it was, I don't remember. I, I think he was martyred, but it was during the, one of the, one of the, one of the martyrdom things. So, and I know that, um, I think also, I don't want to talk about Clement, because Clement, I think, was, anyway, sorry, I'll look that up, though. I will let you know. Jerome, oh, sorry, any other questions? So Jerome, this dude was, a, this guy wrote a lot. This guy, man, talk about, he must have had writer's cramp. You know, my bus driver, used, we had to go on the bus, and we spent 45 minutes on the bus to get to school because we lived in the mountains, so we had to move the, go to the school. My bus driver, every time you get, they want to kick you off the bus, they made you write 100 sentences on why you got kicked off the bus. She's like, he used to tell us, you're going to give you writer's cramp. Well, the thing is, this guy must have got him because this guy is one of the most prolific writers. The, the guy wrote more than almost anybody else. He wrote so much stuff. 
I mean, it's funny. I've, I actually got a new book and I got it for free, but it's basically all stuff on Jerome and everything. And the guy had to, the guy had to have wrote a good thousand pieces of literature. I mean, and he got to remember, he didn't have a word time, you know, a typewriter. He used a pen and ink, a quill. Guy wrote a lot. Now, the thing about it, um, he was really one of the most learned men, very smart guy. But he also wrote the Vulgate, the Latin translation. So now remember from the intertestamental period, what was the translation that changed Judaism and Christianity? Remember the intertestamental period? What translation changed Judaism and Christianity? The Greek translation, yes, yes. Okay. So the thing is, just like that, they needed a Latin translation because the Latin translation from Rome was speaking Latin. Gaul was speaking Latin. They were speaking Latin there. So the Greek, there was the Greek side and you got the, the Roman side. So in Rome, they needed a Latin translation. That translation lasted, people used it for over 1,500 years. It was very good. And one of the things that got them to stop using it is people started creating the Bible in their own vernacular. Meaning that they have an English Bible, a German Bible, a French Bible. That's what big thing that changed from there. Now, he was a grump. Now, it's interesting because Tertullian was a grump. Jerome was a grump. And, and John Calvin was kind of a pompous grump. Now, here's the thing. These guys were really, really smart. Now, and I know this, and Jackie's finding this out. My sister Jackie is finding this out about me. I get to the point where I'm so loaded with stuff in my head. She can see I can just like, I go in, I'm just swimming with all this stuff in my head because I'm trying to think. I'm thinking and thinking and thinking 25, hour, 25 hours a day. But the thing is, is that I can, you know, these guys were so smart. They probably just didn't get along with people. They just didn't understand things. And I just really think that I kind of feel that way because, you know, showing up with a wedding in shorts like I did was not the best thing to do. So, because I wasn't thinking. Because I was focusing on class and everything else. So, true story. Not good. So, I can, I can feel for these guys. All right. Ambrose. Now, Ambrose reminds me of Jeff, and our pastor slash preacher. I say, that, I say pastor slash preacher because people are watching on YouTube. So, I want to let you understand not everybody knows what a preacher is. So, pastor slash preacher. Now, Jeff, man, I'll tell you the one thing about Jeff that I love, love, love is the guy is a statesman. Man, that guy can, that guy can be, can be, you know, everybody feels like, oh, yeah, Jeff, I understand, Jeff, yeah, I understand. He really gets along with everybody. He does a great job. I'm highly honored, and I learn a lot from Jeff. That's what G um, Jerome, I mean, sorry, Ambrose was like. He was actually a politician before he was, before he was a Christian. He was a politician, so he was able to get along with people. So he was one of the guys that, in the very beginning, kind of went to the emperor because the church and state was, was mixed. They didn't have a difference. I talked a lot about church and state in here, and we're actually going to have a, a teaching on it in a few weeks on church and state. But the church and state was mixed, so he was able to go because he was so good talking with people and talking with leaders and everything. He was good, so he was a good gap between them, especially, and I also mentioned here, that one of the problems that we had in the beginning is that a lot of emperors became, became Arian. Remember Arianism? Christ is down here. So a lot of emperors became Arian, and he had to fight against that. So he also taught Augustine, Augustine, whatever you want to call him. Let me tell you, the guy, that's pretty awesome because Augustine one of the greatest church fathers of all time. So, all right, one other thing, thing about Ambrose, Ambrose took Jesus' command very seriously about taking care of the poor. Let me tell you, one thing I love about this church, and I've just recently learned that, boy, the backpack program is amazing, and it is giving to people. Let me tell you, I really don't want to be thought of as the church that has the correct name. I don't want to be thought of as the smartest church. I don't want to be thought of as, oh, that we, they're just the most you know, learned church. No, no, no. What I want to be thought of by non-Christians is they're the most giving church. They're the most kind church. They're the most, they're the most loving church that I've ever met. They welcomed me. They, just, they brought me in and helped me. Wow. And that was his idea. 
If I would, if I go to heaven, I would love for not to find out, or if I ever find out what non-believers think about us, I would love for them to say that we're the most loving church they've ever been to, kindest church we've ever been to, giving church. And because of all those backpacks, I'm hoping that's exactly what people see, and they come to know Jesus because of it. He actually melted down some of the golden stuff, and they had like they were, because they had like the offering plates and stuff and communion stuff. It was gold. He, he melted it down to, to actually free some people that were kidnapped. The guy was, he said, forget it. And they, they got mad at him. What are you doing melting the church's stuff down? He goes, what, what am I, why did she worry about that? It's, God, it's God's stuff, and people need it. So he was like, yeah, so good guy. All right, Augustine, I love this guy. Augustine, his guy is, I mean, I just, he has, nobody is like Augustine. He wrote some great stuff. Prior to Calvin, he was the first guy to really produce a good exegesis of, you know, of theology. He really described theology. I don't agree with everything in his theology, but I think the guy was amazing in what he did. He wrote City of God. All right, Athanasius. I love, this is my favorite church father. I've told you guys this many times. This guy is amazing. He is my favorite church father. He had the campaign against Arians. He was the campaign against Arians, okay? He also is the one who for, for, to first proclaim the 27 books. He actually helped put the Bible together. Good guy. He, he didn't even want to put the Apocrypha in there, and neither did Jerome, by the way. Jerome and Athanasius did not want the Apocrypha in there. But popular consensus said, no, put it in there. So just so you know, these guys were smart. They know the Apocrypha, eh, not the best stuff to have in there, but, but they, he, they, they caved in. All right, so Athanasius had to endure a lot. He was exiled five times, five times, all because of Arian emperors. Arian, emperors that were Arian. They, they, that was a big problem. He's the guy who wrote about him. He was exiled five times. But one of the things I do want to tell you guys, and I was just, again, listening to this last night, one of the greatest books, if there is one book I'm going to tell everybody you need to read, it's On the Incarnation by, on the Incarnation by Athanasius. Do you want to understand who Jesus is, why Jesus came, why God sent Jesus, why, why God needed Jesus in the first place? Everything you ever want to know about Jesus, this guy... When, when you, you've heard the say he wrote the book on it, well, literally, he did write the book on it. This is the guy that did write the book on Jesus. And let me tell you, I was just reading it last night. The good news is, this book is F-R-E-E -E online. You go, it's, it's, it's the right price. It's free. So there's PDF, you can read it. Also, if you have Audible, it's free on Audible. But let me tell you, I have never read anything that's that awesome, how he explains things of why we needed Jesus to come, why man's sin came about, what God saw with us when he created us. Why did he put the, put the tree in the garden? Why did he, oh my gosh, the guy, he just amazing. So I highly recommend it. All right. Fall of the Roman Empire. Now, they want, this is the bad boy that caused it all. This guy caused all kinds of problems. I wrote a lot on that in here. I go into a lot more detail in here than I do on here because I can do that here. I have more, have more time to do that. So one thing to think about it, that, that first of all, when, when Rome fell, only half of it fell. To say the whole empire fell is not true. Only half of it the western half. The eastern half was, remember, Constantine was in Constantinople by this time, in modern name Turkey. And, for, and just to help Jackie out, Turkey is actually a country that's different than, than Italy. So Jack, my sister, has, she, she's geographically challenged. It's not near Minnesota. It's, you know, but the thing is, it's actually over here. So the eastern empire continued to go for another thousand years. They literally lasted another thousand years. The Eastern Orthodox Church came out of that. So, what, you know, what really happened here? Now, what are the problems with the, fault with the Roman Empire was, number one, they had too much territory to defend. 
They had a huge amount of territory, all of North Africa, all of the, you know, a lot of the Middle East. If you have all, you have, you know, um, Turkey, you have the Balkans, you have, you have um, Greece, you have Italy, you have France, you have Spain, you have England. It was huge. And the key is that there was a lot to do. Plus, um, whenever they lost battles, lost some territory, they lost their slave labor force. Yes. The, the whole Roman Empire was based upon slavery. The slave empire, who do you think built those Roman roads, those Roman aqueducts? Sad but true. Sad but true. But you've got to remember, back in that time, that's what everybody, I mean, every country you look at, they had a slave system. Even Israel. Even Israel was allowed to keep some slaves as long as they weren't Israeli. Not good. All right. Plus, they were messing with the military, and Christianity also had a big thing in this. All right, so Rome, Rome did not have a border like us in Canada, okay, or us in Mexico. It's not like that. The border that they had, everybody hated them. So it's like, it's almost like Canada absolutely hates us, and we have to live here, and they, all they want to do is wipe us out. That's what it was like in Rome, because every border place, so it's like, Mexico and Canada, everybody wants to come in and take what we've got, and they're coming after us. That's how bad it was. So, it meant that they had very large things to protect. Rome went through numerous civil wars because, <coughs> because the thing is, these guys, the whole thing, remember I said that the one thing that you, could, you can guarantee, if you're a slave or if you're a captive, whatever, you go to the military because that's your way to success. Military was the way to success back then. The, just so you know, the Roman military, it's estimated they had at least one million soldiers. United States doesn't even have one million soldiers. Okay? I don't think we even have half that. It's, it's amazing how much they had to keep it. So... But also, what they also did is they started recruiting foreigners to fight their wars. Well, they couldn't do it anymore, so let's see if, these, if these, these foreigners and what they would do, stupid Rome, just like stupid U.S., they would make them promises. Hey, come fight our wars. Actually, I wrote a song called, um, called Imperial, and that's one of the things I put in there. Come and fight our wars. The people shouted out with glee, woohoo! And maybe one day we'll let your people go free, I wrote in this song. But that's exactly what these guys did. Maybe one day we'll let you free. And guess what they did? Nope, they didn't. That was a big issue. They did not live up to their promises. Not a good idea because these guys got, these foreigners just so happened to be good fighters and they were kind of mad about it. I don't blame them. So it caused them to turn against Rome. So Christianity also helped in its downfall. Because the whole thing is, it was a pagan system. It was a system, about polytheistic system, and it wasn't good. And Christianity came and shook all of that up. It really challenged all the things and the ideas of the Romans and everything. And it caused problems. But the reality was, they were having problems even before Christianity got here. And that's the reason why, the whole reason why Augustine wrote City of God was because they were having problems prior to us getting there, the Christians getting there. They were already having an issue. Just like it would say, just like to say that America fell because of this reason. But no, America, you know, America, everybody's going to fall, and, but it's going to be over years and years and years of misuse, and that's really what it was. So the thing is, though, one of the things that also creates is like Arianism and the Donatism. Donatism was a big problem in the in the early church on what, you know, they're very hardcore believers. They're the people, if you sinned, they kicked you out of the church and you're not coming back. Not everybody thought really liked Adonis too much. We also see this played out because what happened because of the fall of Roman Empire, Islam was able to rise. And again, if you want to understand, Islam is, it's not a good religion, okay? And there's no, there's no comparing Islam and Christianity. The video I just did last week is all about, uh, well, I should say half of it is about Islam. 
what Islam did, what the re why, what people, people like to think that it's, we have the same God as Islam. No, completely different gods. So Islam was a very big problem. So, so City of God was written. Now, in four, in 24, on the 24th of August, 410, a guy named Alarak sacked Rome. Now, when I say sacked, that's the nice way of saying came in, raped, pillaged, and I'm not kidding when I said raped, raped and pillaged the city. Okay? And people thought that was the city. They called it the Rome the city of God because it was the pagan city of the Romans. So when Rome fell, it devastated people. It would be like today if someone came and take, took Washington, D.C., some of us was like, well, that's not that too bad. But no, it is bad, you know, because the reality is, is that that's our nation's capital. It would really hurt us as a people. So this shocked the people, to say the least. Augustine wrote, wrote his book about this, saying, and I'll tell you the great thing about Augustine's book, City of God, he's saying, look, the key is, is looking to the God in the future, God, what God does for it. It's not the city we live in. It's not where we live, because here's the point. America will fall too. Everybody falls. It's just the way it is. Just, but the key is, is what Augustine was saying is let's look to the creator, the master craftsman, the one who did everything. Let's look to him. So the city of response to Rome, politics, politicians, what they were doing, they were scrambling and what politicians were doing was pointing at the Christians saying it was your fault. The Christians did it. No. Come on. No, no, no. I think we've covered enough to say, no, that's really not true. So, and he basically pointed out, ultimately, it was Rome's fault. So, Romans, to the Romans, Rome was the city of God. But to Augustine, God's city was eternal. No matter what happens to us on earth, God is our refuge. Heaven is eternal. Regardless of what we have, I promise nothing we have down here is going to be as great as it's going to be when we go up there. Okay? And regardless of what we go through. And what do you think people die for their faith for? Because the reality is they die for their faith because they realize what they have is something better than, and what they're going to receive is something better. So what we need to do is we need to put on the full armor of God. We've got to be ready. I'm not, I'm not being a doomsdayer. I'm not saying, I'm not saying, oh, he's going to, this is what's, no, I have no idea what it's, it will happen, I guarantee it, because it always does. But the key is, is Christians need to be ready, okay? On the day of trouble, who do you think the world's going to look to? Think about 9-11. How many people went back to church after 9-11? I always love this picture that I saw when I was in the military. I was in um, Desert Storm. Number, I wasn't in Desert I was in Okinawa during that time. But Desert Storm, when Desert Storm was then, what they did is when they were about ready to go in and, and fight the war, you know, there was some, there was some pastors, with preachers, whatever you want to call them. They were there, and what they were doing is baptizing people. You wouldn't, I saw the video, that saw the picture. The line was out, I mean, the line for people to be baptized was just forever in the desert. People come back during those times. That's when people come back to Jesus, is during those times. On the day of trouble, the world's not going to be celebrating Pride Month. They're not going to care about that anymore. Or look to the government for their needs. What they're going to do, the government won't be able to help them anyway. They're going to look to Jesus. They're going to look to us. And if we're ready... If we're ready, we make got to make sure we're prepared, not just for ourselves, but for others. Matthew 25, 1 and 2. At that time, kingdom of heaven would be like ten virgins who took their lamps and went outside to meet the bridegroom. Five of them were foolish, five of them were wise. I'm going to tell me, why were they wise? What makes them wise? Prepared, prepared with what? Right, but prepared how? They had extra oil. They were, they were prepared. They were waiting. They were ready to wait. They're like, okay, we're good. We can wait all you want. Wait all you want. 
When I was talking to you guys last week about that book, Heinz Feet in High Places, they were at the very beginning of the story, Much Afraid, and I, Jackie, loves this book. It's such a great book. Much Afraid had to meet the shepherd, but she got caught up in, with all these problems, and she couldn't get, so she was so afraid the shepherd was going to leave. But that's the key, is that we've got to be ready when we're going out, because if we were, if we were prepared then when the people and the problems come, like for instance, like I said, 9-11, the church is, you know, I don't know if this church, you know, I'm sure this church probably had grows after 9-11, but I know a lot of churches grew after 9-11 because they're like, wow, you know, this is bad. If they can get them, they can get me. So the key is I want everybody to know, let us get our lives right with Jesus and be prepared for whatever the world throws at us. Because that's what we're here to do as Christians. We need to be the light. Again, I want non-believers to say of our church, they are a loving church. I want to go because I see Jesus in that church. I see faith in that church. I see joy in that church. I see it because, let me tell you, what more wonderful thing could we be known as, as one who is a giver? Okay? Is there any questions? Any questions about the fall of the Roman Empire? So I just want to remind everybody, please fill this out. And if you ha don't have one, um, we, have, we have some copies up here of both the packet and this. Make sure you fill this out, because what this is going to do, and actually this is our wonderful, we can, th we can thank our elders for this, because I go into him saying, I wonder how I'm doing the class. Because, and again, I like, reason why I care about that is because I want to make sure it's the best for you guys. I don't care, you know, I don't care about me. I want to make sure this is the best for you guys. So, and our wonderful elder said, hey, why don't you do this? And I'm like, woohoo, that's a good idea. So, so, and I did do this. So, please fill it out. Let me have, give it back to you if you want to put your name on there or you can text it to me, whatever it is. And one other thing, again, I want to remind everybody, Christian History Magazine is really good. It will help you learn. They actually, there's a story in this magazine uh, about, about someone in Rome at about 45 AD. It's, it's, a, it's, it's, it's fiction, but it's a story, and you actually have, there's some people they talk about that I know you know about. I'm going to leave that for you. So anyway, all right, and that's about it. So let me know. Yes, sir. The authors of Apocrypha, I can tell you exactly who they were. They are Jews in the intertestamental period. They were all Jewish. Um, yeah, kind of, but the problem is we don't know if it's true or not. The problem with the Apocrypha was is that when you really look at it, they, like one of them said, one is, one is uh, Baruch, which was, say it's from Baruch, which is Jeremiah's scribe, but it was written in the, in the, during the intertestamental period, which that's impossible. He wasn't even alive then. The other one was the Mac Maccabees. Uh, one other one was, uh, there was a bunch of those books. And, and the problem is they were all written by Jews. But again, the key with the Apocrypha is what did the Jews think about it? Because they're the ones who wrote it. They don't even agree with it. That's the key with the Apocrypha. The Jews don't even agree with it because it's just not historically accurate. And the problem is because it caused so many problems in the church Again, would be, you know, the ideas of purgatory, praying for the dead, everything else. They finally just got rid of it. They didn't, but what they did in the Maccabees was wrote about praying for the dead. And it was just a written story in the midst of this whole thing. And again, one of the big, so the Christ, early, some of the early Christian people, they read that and was like, oh, okay, praying for the dead. Oh, okay, but yeah, not good. Any other questions? One other thing I will mention to you guys, and we're, this is going to be it. I will stop talking after that. Um, is the depression? Is that okay to say that? De depression video? Is that? Okay. So they, I put out a video on depression, and it's on right now media. Is that where it's at? Okay. Um, Bob, Bob, and or, or the elders know how to get there. They can get you there. But I highly recommend it if you or your family members have depression. I wrote, it, I wrote it clinically and also scripturally. 
So when I teach it in school, I don't put the scripture in there, but I give the clinical stuff. For you guys, I give not only the clinical stuff, but the scripture. So I tell you what's going on in the brain, why it happens, the di what medications do to your brain, how, the body, how we need to work with it, how to deal with it, how to manage it, what to do to keep yourself from getting depressed. So please let me know if you like it, and I'm planning on printing to doing more after that. All right, guys, thanks so much. Have a good day. Make sure you get your copies. All right. I used to get the history magazine. Oh, it's awesome. I love and it. I, it was years ago.